All right, are there any questions with regards to what we started discussing yesterday? Yes? No question? Then you have questions. Are there any questions with regards to what we studied? Oh. Wow. Yes, sir. Question? Uh huh? Ask away. Okay. Yes. Now, while I was researching, I came across something like uh, pipeline hazard. Okay. Yes. So, um, I really had time to really understand what it's all about. No, but did you read? Did you read? Yes, I did. What did it say about pipeline hazard? Something like uh, some instructions cannot be uh, instructions like branching. Branching, interrupt operation, read and write instructions. Okay, what about them? That uh, they might cause a lot of errors or problems if so, the pipeline is long. Such as? Time. Such as what problems? Um, You're on the right track, obviously. You're clearly reading the right things, but I don't know if you were actually reading, because uh, if you were in actual fact reading, uh, you would not have uh, questions. I don't know. What is the question again? What challenges? You're not being explicit here. Data hazards, what other challenges are there? So those are like disadvantages, right? Forgot my glasses that have to be somewhere close by here, sorry. Very unusual here. Yes, continue with the, with the challenges. What else? Uh, that's okay. So I didn't, I didn't really understand. <coughs> Read some more. So uh, an easier way of trying to figure out what, what sort of challenges are associated with uh, so-called branch well, instructions, like branch instructions, is to look up workarounds for those things, right? And I'm sure you came across things like branch prediction or something. Read up on what that is. Yes. You must learn to read, right? Turns out the answers I'm going to give you, I found out about those answers because I read. Because I like to, I like to read. Oh, sorry. Well, not that I like to read, but because I have to read sometimes, I have to sit here, I forgot my glasses. I still can't see there. <clears throat> okay. Is that fine? Are there any other questions? We, we did, uh, we, yesterday was more like a, a revision session, really, where we were trying to remind ourselves of what we did um, in lecture series number number six and, and, and lecture series number 21, I think, right? That's, for the most part, that's what we did. Uh, and specifically for lecture series number 21, what we said was that we, we had deliberately uh, omitted the fact that um, there are actually big segments associated with those different, um, those, those different, uh, those different number of bits associated to the three different types of instructions, right? So. <clears throat> During our dis discussions of R, R format, I format, and J format instructions, we, we, we only focused on the number of bits allocated to things like the opcode, uh, uh, source, source register, target register, destination register, the shift amount, things like the funct code, right? But, but we neglected to mention that in actual fact, the, the ordering of the, the bits themselves is from 31 going to zero. Right, so we know that the opcode is always from 31 all the way up to 26, right, for all the three types of instructions. Okay, cool, can't see. Uh, so, but uh, 
A, a few things to mention here. The, the quiz, right? It's due day after tomorrow, so you have a few days to kind of like work through it. It's a very, it's not a very difficult thing here. Um, so we have until Wednesday to practice, no cheating. We shall find out, in case if you think uh, the copy checker we've showed you is the only way to find out if you're cheating, wrong, right? We shall know. Um, and then I might not be around, I won't be around actually in the week of the 21st, and so to, to, to ensure that we, we cover what needs to be covered, uh, I am proposing that we have makeup classes uh, the next couple of three Sundays, so next, next Sunday, the other Sunday, and the other Sunday as well. Oh. I'm an Adventist, I'm a recent convert. <laughs> yes, I am, I am. Well, I have to go to church. Well, well I mean, I have to go to... Toela, why, why, why are you shaking your head? Arthur, are you, are you, are you I mean, do you have any issues with, with Sunday? Huh. Right, if, if King Arthur says no, then we shall proceed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but... Listen, but what I'm, what I'm suggesting is in one of these sessions, maybe what we can do is just uh, combine the two sessions together, right? What test is that? Oh, okay. What, what time? Are you busy Friday? Well, we can't kind have of Friday. I will liaise with the two class trips to find out when during the week we can have class. It's most likely going to be between five and six, or between six, five and six actually, or maybe between six and seven, but five and six most likely. But I'll confirm because of the confusion that is there. If it doesn't work out, then we shall have uh, two makeup sessions here, so two hours essentially, right? Uh, but, but the thing is, uh, we, we, we're, we're trying to make sure that we cover as much as possible. It if it does ten, turn out that, that in actual fact we would have covered uh, the content we need to cover by the time we get to this week, then we probably won't have the last makeup, right? Uh, okay. Do we understand the question, sorry? Do we understand the question in the, uh, the quiz, right? You know, well, which part, don't, why didn't you send mail to say I don't understand the question? Which part did you not understand? Okay. This. Yeah, just calculate the contribution of the quizzes to the ICT level. So here's a question for you. I'll answer first John's comments. How many quizzes have been graded so far? Okay. So if it's 14 and you prompt the user to enter the quiz scores, the the user has to enter all the 14 quiz scores. Enter quiz, whatever, enter quiz score one, quiz score two, right? 14 times. Easy stuff. If, if, uh, if the user was, was being prompted to enter these scores, let's say, uh, in the second week of, of uh, in the second week of term one, or in the third week of term one, then it's just one quiz, just enters one quiz on quiz session. And the other question is, uh, what is the contribution of a quiz to the, to the total score? Okay, so if it's one and the quiz is always out of 10, then how hard can it be for you to figure out mathematically what the contribution is for the quizzes that the user would have entered? So for instance, if I'm this user and I enter, I, I got a six, like let's say I'm being prompted when we had written or when three quizzes had been graded, I'll enter six, I'll enter seven, I'll enter eight, right? Three quizzes. If, if each quiz is equal to one, uh, if each quiz is equal to one and we're going to write 20 quizzes, then what, is, what are these scores cumulatively relative to the total score? That's a question. And in fact, it's just a matter of Scaling this to a one or something.
I asked someone to say, what, what is the weighting of, what is the weighting of one quiz? Okay, and we're gonna have to do a, a bit of, a, 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 I see where this is coming, we're gonna have to do a bit of, a, and it's going to turn out to be really stupid, but it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, because we're not dealing with floating point numbers, you can make certain assumptions like, Round off to the nearest number. If, if, I know maybe this is where the problem is coming from. Make the assumption that you're rounding off to the nearest number. If a person got a four in a quiz, then it's a zero. If you, get, if you got a five up to 10, then it's a one. So what you're saying is that if, if, a quiz, if a quiz is worth one mark, what is this? 0.6, but because we, have, we didn't cover floating point numbers, then we're saying this will just be rounded off. Mm, round off, right? This is 0.7, so it's going to be a one. It's fine, it's just an approximation. The, the idea is what we are looking at uh, solving here. Is this fine? Yeah, so but the key thing here is we are just using loops, right? Uh, if the, if the, the user is being prompted at a time when the only three quizzes had been graded, you loop three times. If, if, you are, if you, you're prompting a user right now, you loop how many quizzes you said? 14 times. So the thing is you get, better get it right, right, looping. That's it, so the, the, the thing here is figuring out when to stop. When to, st how many times to loop and when to stop looping. This is where the thinking is. The, the math part is easy, right? How do you get 0 0.6? 6 divided by 10, right? Uh, so how, how, would you, how would you figure out whether, whether 0.4 is going to result into a 0 or a 1? You're going to say, when you divide the quiz score by 10, what would be in the lower register is the result, which is 0. Remainder? Six, if the remainder is greater than five, add a one. If not, it's a zero, right? The, the person who does maths here is looking at me like I'm some alien or something. You do maths, you know what I'm talking about here. This is making sense, right? And this is like grade school maths. What I'm, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. So what I'm saying is that um, what I'm saying is that because we are not dealing with floating point numbers, you're going to have to round off the you're going to have to round off the um, the scores. For you, because somebody told us that each quiz has a weighting of one, for you to find out the weighting of each quiz that the user enters, you'd have to divide the score of the user the score is always out of 10, by 10. So the weighting of this is 0 0.6. Let's say the user here got three, for instance. 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.3. What we're saying is that we will make the assumption, you can make the assumption, this is justification anyway, you will make the assumption that this, anything that is greater than five is just a one. Anything less than five is a zero because we're dealing with integers. Yeah, if you feel like uh, experimenting with floating point number, submit floating point number solution, right? You don't get extra marks though. So this would be rounded off. But how do you round it off? Because you're going to have to, to say DIV for this particular one, it would be DIV, the input score, which is C, whatever, well, let's say this is like in eight or something, and then uh, 10 is equal to, 10 or something. So it would be like div 8 comma 10. We know that this operation is going to result into um, what is going to be in here if we are dealing with this. What is in low is 0. What is in high is 
So the other thing that you have to check is, is you know that this is if this is this is zero quite right. This is always going to be zero one actually. By the way, if you think about this, the answer in the low register, whatever number you think about between zero and ten, will result in either a zero or a one. If it's a one, it's fine. The person got ten out of ten since the one. But if it's a zero, what you have to do is do an extra check where you 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 check to see if this value here is greater than or equal to five. Like the rounding off, right? Ceilings and floor and whatnot. You're saying you round off to the nearest integer. So you can make the assumption to say if the score is, if the remainder is five all the way up to nine, then you just add one here. So that anything, anything that falls within the range 0 0.5 up to 0 0.9 is going to be a one. And then you just cumulatively add the scores. Not so hard, is it? The, the grading really is going to take into account, we want to see if you understand, and you better get the loops right, right? We want to understand, because the loops are coming on the, on the 11th. We want to see if you understand loops, their conditions here, right? Uh, their conditions, the ones I, the one I was talking about, say, if the thing in the high register is greater than five, then you're going to add a one, right? Otherwise, you don't do anything. And then, more importantly, you'd have to figure out a way of getting out of the loop. How are you going to get out of the loop? That's where the, the other thinking is going to be, right? I mean. Like it can be something as easy as saying, uh, if, if a user, and I mentioned this in the, the, one of the most recent charts we had, you can just use a sentinel value to say, if a user enters a number that is outside the range you're working with, because for quizzes you're working within this range, you can tell the user as part of the program, please enter the quiz score. Oh my God. Please enter the quiz score. I hope this thing hasn't stopped uh, running. Not that it matters. <laughs> You can just say, please enter the quiz score, or you, you, you enter the quiz score, or enter the quiz score, or negative one to exit, or enter the quiz score, or 100 to exit. It's up to you. You understand what I mean? And then you'd have to have a condition, whatever value you use, you say, please, you can have like something like, please, I'm not saying you should do this, but I'm just giving you an idea, right? For you to specify a value, it's like a, you know how they say a code word for you, for, for, for someone to know what they need to do, right? You tell them to say, start entering quiz scores or enter negative, or, or, or enter negative one when you're done uh, entering the quiz scores. Like it just say, please enter the quiz scores and uh, enter negative one when you're done entering the score, so that you would have another condition which would check if the user has entered the other sentinel value, that the value that falls outside the range. So if you, you want to use negative one, you'd have a condition that says branch if equal the value that the user is entering. If it's equal to whatever is holding negative one, branch to exit or something. That's when you exit the loop or branch to the part that prints the quiz score. You could just print the, uh, the quiz score actually in the exit branch, if you wish, I guess, and then you have this. Is this fine? Now, now that I have given you the logic, or we've discussed the logic, I'm not saying this is the only way. There are plenty of approaches, especially the smart maths miners that are in here. You probably already figured out the, a better way of doing this. It's fine, I'm just showing you uh, uh, potentially viable approach that will work, right? All you have to do is just go and implement it. This thing, there was a question. This was it? Yeah. Is this making sense? I want you to do this because I know that you doing this will, will, will in fact, will, will enable you prepare for the test. If you do this, if you're able to get this right without a problem, there shouldn't be a very big issue with the test here.
Yes, sir. Sorry? What? How are you getting the all together? What is? This is interesting. Yeah. Are we getting the input together or from one at a time? Now, I'll ask you a question, Brighton, right? So, how do you get all the inputs? Let's say it's 14 quizzes. How are you going to get them all at once? How? Yeah, how? Because it will be different users, right? So, how are you going to add them? What do you mean adding them? Sorry? There's, there's a, you see, the reason I'm, I'm trying to probe his approach further, right? Is, is, is already, are you doing maths, by the way? No. Oh, okay. He's, he's, uh, what he's saying, right, is, is that instead of going in a loop, right, and, and then for every entry, whatever it is you do, you're still going to go in a loop, right? Otherwise, I'm going to get all the values. But his thinking here is, I will go in a loop, and then I will instead, let's say if it's six plus, he would do six plus seven plus eight, if it's three quizzes. If you add this, are you not going to be able to determine what the score is relative to the total? <coughs> Sorry? Thank you. So two approaches. You can either, as you're looping, you add them, thank you sir, kind sir, you add them, and then you, you, you get them relative to the total score, which is 20, or you can get the weighting as you are looping, and then do this checking. Don't know, whatever works for you. And I'm sure there are people that are thinking about other smart ways of doing this, which is good. This is, we are getting somewhere here. Um, thanks a lot. Are there any other questions with regards to the, we have an, enough time. Please, uh, if I were you, I would maybe just spend the entire day in the lab today so that I fix this. Instead of waiting on Wednesday, because bad things do happen, you find that on Wednesday things are not working and it's 23.57, you're sitting there and sweating, right? If I were you, I would do this today, because you can actually do this today, in less than an hour, actually. <laughs> okay, so, if there are no questions and we continue our discussion, you know, the greatest fear is going blind here. I, I don't think I'll be able to work, right? Going blind. Can't see. But I, I could be here. I have a friend who is, uh, I don't know why I'm talking about John here. I should call her, I guess. She's visually impaired. She's blind, right? It's, wow, I don't know how she. Interesting enough, her machine was always, uh, you know how the brightness? It was always dark. It's always dark, you know. Very nice person, very smart person. She works for IBM now. Okay, so um, for those of you that know what IBM, or who IBM is, she's based in Johannesburg, she call her. Uh, so we, we got to a stage where we said, uh, in fact, our primary focus during our discussion on so-called data path is, is primarily going to, to, to involve just looking at these, these uh, hardware components, right? Um, so this is what I was talking about to say, uh, this is going to be important as we are walking through the sample sample kind of instructions here. He said, uh, in fact, there, there are specific bit segments that are uh, associated with these different components, depending on which instruction you are dealing with, right? So for our formatted instructions, for instance, bit position number 31 or the output 26 is the opcode. In fact, for all of them, 31 to 26 is the opcode. For our, our formatted instructions, 25 to 21 is register source. 20 to 16 is register target or uh, input register number two, and then bit pattern 15 to 11 is the destination register, 10 to six is the shift amount, five to zero is a funk code, right? And, and then you notice here that you can easily derive these things actually. If all, all you have to know is that uh, the counting starts from 31 all the way up to zero, right? 31, 31, is it minus six or something? I don't know. Uh, or 31 minus, uh, yeah, minus six will give you the 20, 26 that you need here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we said our focus is gonna be in that. And, and as we are starting with uh, our, our format instructions here, um, just to remind us that, I thought I fixed this. 
Okay, just to, to remind us that, uh, in fact, the, the things that we're going to be dealing with is, um, oh, we, we discussed these things in, in succession, but we, for, for this particular first part, we just focus on the components that are associated with our formatted instructions, right? Um, very important component in the data path is, and by the way, when you're talking about the data path, we're essentially describing or making reference to the path that the instructions will follow in order for them to be executed by the machine. So the path that an R formatted instruction uh, follows is going to be different from the one that an I format instruction is going to follow. Right? So register file, very important component, right? Um, essentially what the register file does is it, 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 it provides or it, it's, it's, it provides a mapping between um, Oh. It provides a mapping for the different register components or the registers that are involved in whatever instruction might be dealing with, right? So it keeps, it's a lookup table that keeps track of which registers need to be used depending on which instruction you're executing, right? Uh, remember, for instance, if I give an example of an uh, R format instruction like the add instruction, you're dealing with three registers, right? So those re three registers, there's essentially a lookup table, which is a, a register, the register file itself, that um, has a mapping of which wires actually go to the specific 32 registers that you'd be working with for um, integer values, right? But the, the, the key thing to note here is that um, th there are different types of registers that you'd be working with, right? Uh, so source register, uh, two source registers and destination register. We've mentioned this before. The, the number that is used to represent the register that you'd be working with is different from the value that is held by the register itself. Right, so the specific register that you'd have in a particular instruction would, would be represented using five bits the value that it holds is represented using 32 bits for MIPS. Why? Because we mentioned that uh, all registers are 32 bits in size. We also mentioned that uh, insofar as registers are, uh, integer values are concerned, we have a total of 32 registers. So it does make sense that you, you, you'd, you'd have five bits to represent the registers, the 32 registers, because two to the power five gives you 32. So um, a, a logical view, a visual representation of your register file would be akin to something like this, where you notice that it, it has, um, it takes in a maximum of two input registers, right? So it would be like register source number one, register source number two. And then it takes in also input the destination register. So the location where you'd want to write data to. Uh, so for instructions that um, involve you writing in, uh, output to a register, for instance, like add, uh, this write register would be your RD, because this is where you actually write the result of whatever computation might be performing at that point in time. Yes? Why? Well, because, uh, because we have a total of, um, when we started our discussion of MIPS, we said the, the 32 integer registers, zero all the way up to 31. For you to be able to represent all the 32 registers, uh, it makes sense that you, you use five bits, a maximum of five bits at least. Right? Um, two to the power five is 32. Zero up to 31 gives you 32 registers. So this is why you need, you need 32, I mean you need five bits, essentially. What? Yeah, you get scores. I mean, so it's because five bits will, will be able to, 
to represent all the 32 registers? If such a question was to come, I don't know if it would come, but um, maybe it would, I don't know. Right, so if, if you look at the, the visual representation here, we're saying our register file takes in, it takes in source register, right? Number one, source register number two, uh, because you know the different scenarios that would be, uh, that would encounter in MIPS, we can only have a maximum of two operands, I mean, uh, two input operands, right? Think about this for a second. The different instructions that we've dealt with, add, branch, like B, BLT, BGT. In most of these instances, the maximum number of input registers you're working with is just two. Which is why we're saying this register file will typically have, um, uh, will take in two, two input registers, right? So register number one and register number two. It will also take in as input um, a register where information is going, or data is going to be written to, right, right, right register. But each of these two input registers has, or outputs a value. The value it outputs is the data that it's holding. Because we are saying registers are primarily used to temporarily store data, right? This data could be a number, it could be uh, a character, for instance, it could be part of a uh, part of a string, right? It could be anything. Uh, so whatever register you're dealing with, we eventually output whatever is in that register, and whatever is in that register is 32 bits in size, right? Which is why we have the 32 there. Um, so when it comes, so the same goes for for this. This is associated with this. So. Uh, input register, output value from the register, input register, output value from the register. For the write register, again, five bits are used to represent what you're writing to the register you're writing to. 32 bits are used to represent what you're going to write to the register, right? Because it has to be 32 bits. The other interesting aspect associated with the register file is um, an input value that's referred to as a, a reg write. Uh, it's just one bit in size. And essentially what this does is it specifies whether or not um, a particular operation that you're working with is going to involve writing data to a register or not, right? So uh, a one is used to represent the fact that you are writing data to the register, and in this case you'd be writing data to the write register. And a zero would simply mean that you're not writing anything to a register. Okay. Right, so this is what I was saying. Uh, I just realized that there's a bit of an iffy issue here. If you look at RD, we're saying, uh, sure, you're dealing with 32 bits here, but, but in fact, we know that when it comes to MIPS, you, you'll be handling both signed and unsigned numbers, right? So in fact, the range of values is not zero up to this number here, but it's supposed to be negative two to the power 32 minus one minus one, uh, all the way up to two to the power uh, 32 minus one, right? Um, then you have a range that, uh, or numbers that are able to take into account negative values and positive values as well. Um. Okay, um, so still on, on R formatted instructions, the other uh, key component that you typically be dealing with is the actual AOU, right? So the component that actually does the the computation, the adding, or the sub subtracting, or multiplication, or the logical operations, right? Um, uh, right, so what it does, like we discussed before, I think this was lecture uh, series number six, is it essentially just performs very basic or rudimentary arithmetic operations, um, and then logical operations as well. Some of these things we didn't discuss, so things like and or all, for instance, those are the logical operations we're talking about, right? Um, and so you notice that it takes in two input values, right? And because, so when you're performing mathematical operations, what you're in fact doing is you're, you're either adding numbers, right? The actual numbers that are, you, that are represented using 32 bits. So it does make sense then that the two input values that go into the ALU have to be 32 bits in size. This would be the, like the actual numbers that you're working with, negative 2019, for instance, four or zero, right? We go here. All of them are represented using 32 bits. So if it's a zero, then it will have to be a stream of 32 zeros, right? If it's a one, then you make sure that uh, the binary representation of one is represented using 32-bit representation, right? 
Um, and then another key thing that um, is typically associated with the uh, with the ALU is the uh, ALU op, right? So remember that this hardware component does a lot of different things, right? So it adds, it subtracts, it multiplies, it divides, right? It performs logical operations. And so the question is, how exactly does it know what it needs to do? The ALU op, right? The ALU op tells it um, whether it needs to perform an addition or a subtraction or whatever arithmetic operation um, you'd be performing at that point in time. Okay. Uh, and, and, and incidentally, right, when it comes to arithmetic operations, obviously the ALU op is going to be derived from the funct code, right? Remember that the op code is always uh, uh, is composed of a stream of six zeros, but the thing that determines uh, the actual arithmetic operation that's going to be done is the funct code, right? So you use the funct code to signal to the AL using the ALU op whether you're going to be adding those two input values or whether you're going to be subtracting them or dividing them. Um, so putting these two different things together, right, so register file and the ALU, uh, uh, arithmetic and logic unit. Uh, just going to have to, before we put them together, I thought it would be nice for us to look at um, a very simple example, right? that would typically use the register file and the arithmetic and logic unit. And what better way to do it than just to look at um, a simple add operation. Right? Uh, ignore one and two. One and two is just there to signal the fact that the things that we are adding, um, the values in register eight and register nine, which is 50 and 40. Right? So, before we trace this operation, just a quick rundown of the streams of zeros that we're dealing with here, we already went through this process of uh, trying to decode this instruction. We know that eventually what the computer is going to do as you are following through this instruction through the data path is it's going to be working with these streams of zeros, right? Six zeros here and then the last, uh, uh, is it five or six, six bits here will signal the fact that it's actually an add operation, yes? Oh, because there are, so there, there are a lot more, there are a lot more R formatted instructions than there are J or I format instructions. So the best way to represent all the potential R format instructions is to, um, is to, so think about this for a second. If we, if we had decided to represent all MIPS instructions using the op code, how many instructions would we, uh, would we represent? The opt code has six, six zeros, right? One, two, I mean six bits, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just say these are ones, right? What is two to the power six? If if you if you were to decide to represent all the possible um, MIPS based instructions using the opt code alone. The six bits wouldn't be enough for you to represent the almost 200 instructions that are there. You can only represent 64 instructions using the opt code because it's six bits. So for you to represent more instructions, and there are, there are a lot more R formatted instructions than there are uh, uh, I or J formatted instructions, um, best way to do that is to combine the six bits with an additional six bits. So you, you, yeah, yeah, they are all zeros because the funct code is, is going to be used to represent the specific R formatted instruction that you're working with. <coughs> so there's, there's, there's a couple of other ways of looking at this, right? The, the fact that if you look at, um, if you look at, uh, there's a compromise that people had to come up with here, right? If you look at the bit segments um, associated with these other I formatted instructions, uh, specifically, let me just go back here. You notice that it would be hard for us to, it would be hard if we had more J instructions, it would be hard for us to represent those J instructions 
with a bit segment other than this. Why? Because we've already allocated 26 bits for the target address where we're jumping to. So bottom line here is we, are, we, are combined, we have all zeros here because the func code segment is there to represent the R formatted instructions. No, no, but when you're talking about the func code, you're just making reference to R formatted instructions. So in fact, what you're, what you're saying is that you, you, should, you, should, you expect MIPS to have, to have no, more than, no more than two to the power six R formatted instructions. Do you understand this? Because the func code is used to represent um, R formatted instructions. All, all R formatted instructions have an opcode equal to zero. Six streams of zeros. The thing that tells you which uh, R format instruction you're working with is a funk code, which is six bits. So implicit what you're saying is that six bits are used to represent R formatted instructions. But the six bits for the, uh, uh, the six bits are associated with the opcode are the ones used to, to determine the MIPS instruction, the specific MIPS instruction you're working with. Uh, look, think about this for a second. Add instruction. Add two, three, four, five, six. Add instruction. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sub instruction. One, two, three, four, five, six. Mod is the same. The thing that's distinguishing these things is what? The funk code, which is also one, two, three, four, five, six. So what we're saying is that if all the different R formatted instructions are represented using zero, then the thing that tells the, the, the number of R instructions that you're going to be working with is going to be two to the power six. The funct code. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> The difference, well, what's the difference between the opcode and the funct code? The opcode is associated with all the three different instruction types. But the funct code is only associated with R formatted instructions. There is no funct code for the I format instruction, is there? Can't see it. Well, maybe you can, but I can't. There's no funct code associated with the J format instruction. Yes, how many J, J formatted instructions do we have? Now think about this for a second, if you've done your homework, how many do we have? Are there more than 10? No. no. <laughs> do you understand this? So they can, so it's a compromise, right? Because, because if you think about what the computer does, a computer does more, the, the, half the time the computer is, is performing arithmetic operations and logic operations. So there are a lot more of these things than there are these other like uh, I format or J format instructions. Right, I mean, go figure, but. Yes. No. His, his question is, uh, these are important questions to talk about, I guess. Uh, I thought people understood what we talked about when we were discussing this. Don't take my word for it, <laughs> right? I, this, is, uh, this is why I like what I do anyway. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's no subjectivity. You say, how are you feeling? I'm feeling bad or good. How do we know what good or bad is? The, the thing that will tell you, uh, mm, I wish I could say I'm the one who invented these things. I didn't. These are other people that did this, but. Um,
Oops. Do you remember this? Observe this number here that says format. Anything that has, <coughs> can you see this? You can, right? Any, all the different entries that have an R have zero slash a number here. Meaning that the opcode for, because this is opcode slash font, right? The opcode for all R formatted instruction is always zero. zero. The opcode for things other than the R format instruction is this particular number. So for instance, for add immediate opcode is hex number eight using six bit representation. Um, the opcode for BQ is hex number four using six bit representation. So the only instruction format that is, that, that is associated with opcode of zero is an R format instruction. Everything else here, you can see this, don't take my word for it, everything else here has an actual number, right? SLT, um, SLTIU, and all those things here. Is this making sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. What, what condition? That the four under what? Is it, you're saying is it true? Yes. Why is it right? B E Q register eight, comma, register nine, comma, go here. <coughs> Label register, register. Operation or opcode. We said that. All these things we are calling labels, that thing that says uh, OX, full colon, uh, dot ASCII, ASCII Z, whatever, and the value 10, I'm sorry, the value A, 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 hello or something. Label, the label is going to be <coughs> converted dynamically to a register value in memory. This is a value, what we're saying here is go here is nothing more than a value, a number, point the register where you're jumping to. So go here is going to be dynamically converted to a register. It's going to be like one, two, three, who cares, right? But so if this is a number, the number is the immediate value. Because it's an immediate value, then you know that it has to conform to an IR format instruction. Don't take my word for it. If you go here, right, if we open up, uh, a sample MIPS, uh, example squares. Do you see what I see here in, in this line that says number 29? Okay, sorry, not number 29. Do you see what I see here in, in this line here? It's telling me to say breakout label, the thing in my code where I, I wrote breakout label. It is going to be it's dynamically converted to this register value. So in fact, when I say B E, when I say B Q and the dollar sign whatever here, um, what I'm saying is branch to this address, which is an immediate value. Because it's an immediate value, what thing has an immediate value? I format instruction. So yes, it is correct. No, it is correct because this is what's happening. It is also correct because the specifications say so. If you go through the green card, the manual, whatever documentation you come across, it will tell you that it's an I format instruction. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Yes. Oh, you're stretching, okay. I also stretch it, so I guess. All right, so I guess, I mean, 
Uh, we'll just we'll continue this on on Wednesday, really. I just so what we are going to be doing on Wednesday is uh, looking at this ad instruction to try and uh, uh, you know kind of understand how you 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 get to strip these 32 bits, right? When you strip them off, we know that part of these the streams of these streams of zeros here, right? When you they are found out, so you have 32 of them. Um, they they, they are redistributed accordingly, so we know exactly what this value here is going to be, right? RIS, RT, RD, right? So we'll be talking about this, anyway, I guess, just to, on Wednesday. Uh, these are slides, right? Now, um, we'll end here, we'll continue this on Wednesday since we already wasted time here. Um, but it's, you notice that it's, if, if you actually understand, if you, if you understand the, the basics associated to the three different types of MIPS instructions, it's quite easy for you to know like which bit segments are going to go here, uh, which values are going to be sent to the ALU, because if you're adding one and two, and you've put one into eight and two into nine, you know that this is going to be register eight, this is going to be register nine. Register eight is holding one, register nine is holding two, and then the value here is going to be 32 bit representation of one, the value here is going to be 32 bit representation of two. This is all you're doing, you're sending them to the ALU, right? And then using the fun code, you tell the ALU to say, what I want to do is I want to add. It will add. Once it adds, right, it uses this. once it adds, um, the reg write is going to be set to one because add involves writing to a register. You write to a register. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you when you see me. Um, I'm gonna stick around slightly in case people have questions for, uh, there are people that said yesterday that they have questions specific to, um, to MIPS, so I'll stick around for a few minutes. If there are no questions, are there any questions so far? We'll get there, we're not going, we're just tracing the, we're not doing anything um, anything out of the ordinary here, it's uh, very simple stuff here. Yes? Sorry, the what? You must whisper here because they're making noise so that we bring the question in the exam. But <laughs> No, question or repeat it. So there's a question here, um, is once they're saying the fun code is the one that knows the actual operation to be done. The the mm -hmm. the fun code, yes. Okay, how does this happen? Because it only enters Oh, so if you look at the com complete data path, right? So maybe I should color code this to showcase the path that uh, I will eventually. So the, the way the approach I'm taking here is uh, instead of saying, instead of color coding the, because the actual data path is this, it starts from instruction fetch, instruction decode, mem, and then write back, right? Instead of, instead of saying, we discuss this all at once, what we are doing is we are doing it bit, chunk by chunk by looking at these components to understand what they do and then later on we stitch it together. It turns out that there's, there's a signal that comes from the funk code, right, that, that passes through like some control unit that will tell the ALU what it needs to do, right, and that thing uh, is translated in this thing we're calling the ALU op. The ALU op is, is it's an input value that goes into the ALU to tell it, to say add, multiply, divide, right? Okay, or perform and or all. All right, uh, see you when you see, oh yes. Yes. Which inputs? Now, why is it that the output is the 2 bit? What when we add the 2, the other 2 to give us what? 
No. Are you sure, are you sure if you add uh, a, a, a number using the two-bit representation and another number using the two-bit representation it will give you 64? You did, you did pay attention when we were discussing number systems, did you? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. What do you mean? The, who said, they're not saying you should come up with that value. Yes, like what value should be? They are not. That, where are they saying come up with that value? Okay, why, why do they have this question? I don't think I'm going to be the address. Well, I don't know. What are they talking about in this section? What about No, no. What, what specifically? This is Indianness they're talking about, right? Memory address, and then now they're trying to give us the example. So I'm trying to say, how, how do you know the lowest memory address in the highest memory address? Which, which is larger, this or that? Because this is a memory address. Which is larger, this value or this value? What? Okay. So if this is la larger and this is the lowest, which is the lowest memory address? Okay. So how do they come up with these memory addresses? So it's hypothetical. They're trying to they're trying to show you an example. So in memory, right? In memory, you have these addresses. This could be, in fact, this might not actually the, the actual numbers, but let's say these are the addresses. Hypothetically speaking, let's say these are the addresses that you have, and uh, the first number is well, the number that you have, number one. Where is number one? There's no number one. No, no, no. Where is number? There are two numbers here you're working with. Uh, 42 and 5,000. <laughs> so this is the second number? Up to. Okay. So second number, which is here. So so what they're trying to show you here is that, is that, is that, uh, what, what Indianness is this? Is that, depending on which Indian you're using, in Little Indian, what, how do you store numbers? And more significant bit. What do you mean, this significant bit? So, byte. <laughs> yes, Mr. Like, in the, in the memory address, in the highest memory address, you store the least, I mean, the most significant bit. In the lowest memory address, you store the least significant yeah. bit. Yeah. So, for number two, look at this. For number two, which is here. And if num if for number two, which is here, which is the least significant bit? So I have to examine the question. Which, which, which is the least significant part of, of this number? Yeah. Okay. So, where is 40 here? If, right? Is this address greater than this address? Because this is the number you're looking at, right? This is a 5 million here. So you can see that the least significant part of the number is stored in the lowest memory address. That's what they're trying to tell you. They're not asking you to find the value here. They're just showing you to say, if you're using little endian, these numbers here are going to be stored like so. For this one, least, least, least part is in the lowest memory address. Uh, most significant bit is in the highest memory address. Okay. So yeah, you probably didn't read everything. What what questions do you have? I told you I don't understand anything. About no, no, no. That's not how it works. You can't say you don't understand anything. What if they say that you're going to help? Yeah, but here's the thing, right? If I tell you now, this is the thing. Like the people on the streets, help me. Help, help you with what? Help. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, I have a question. Uh, it's Banda. So, so down slightly, we shall look at maybe one or two examples. We'll look at uh, 
maybe we'll look at simple examples. We'll start with the basics and then we'll build up just slightly, just a minute or two. What about the function? Yeah, the function. Yeah, function. Yeah, function. Yeah, function. Sorry? Yeah. Function. Which function? Function. What function? I don't know. It's here, we can check. Yeah, print. So what is the question you said that they never bring such a question? Which question is that? It's right here in your tutorial. And you look like I'll get that really well. The other one. Um well I guess I was wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I I guess I was wrong, right? <laughs> What a it's twenty. When it's a sub, no, they're here. They're in the manual. People already came up with these things. So for sub, it's twenty-two. What do you mean? There are a lot of things. Stupid. This is two pages. Just a second. Sorry? They are all here. What you want? You don't have to memorize these things, but if you're interested, for, for Mount, uh, I guess Mount is not. Where is Mount here? Mount is not here in the green card, but I'm sure it's in the. Um, it's in the. Um, in the other reference menu. This thing doesn't have all the instructions like that. Um, yeah, but uh, the, those numbers are pre predetermined for you, which is why in all of these different uh, assessments that we have, towards the end, we, and I guess this, okay, so this doesn't have the, but in the, if, if there's a question to do with this, you'd be, you'd be told to say, MUL has this op code, has this fun code, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. The lectures are on YouTube, but join us with the other groups that want us to look. Stick around. We are looking at. We are looking at YouTube, but if you have time. Can we? What, what? Where are we? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, well, I don't know what this is, but yeah, if this is meets then yeah, this is what I'm, these are the numbers here. Um, sorry? I don't know what this is, let's see. Yeah, so these are the values, so like for mode, for instance, uh, but they're, they're going a step further, they are giving you the bit representation here, binary and X, so yeah, these are the values. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, no, I it's a little bit tricky. I don't have the, the uh, take home quiz. So how will I do it? What do you mean you don't have the take home quiz? You're on Moodle. But I don't know, but you guys get a bit. What do you mean it's not a bit? Like, only the notes. My grades are there. No. If you can see the notes, then you can see the, the quizzes as well. If you can see the lessons, you can see the quizzes. Open it up. Can, can you settle down and let's just quickly look at because I, I only have a few. Well, I'll beam it up there so you can see it anywhere. But yeah. Um, is, is, there, is there a particular, is there a specific example that you would want us to look at? What is it? The basics are in the notes. <laughs> you find it. <laughs> so, so. The, the the thing with the thing with branching, right? The the thing with branching is that um, all you're doing is you're just altering what they call program flow control, right? You're trying to because by by default we're saying that uh, a program is executed top to bottom, one line at a time. But there are certain instances when you know um, 
a particular condition might be met, in which case you might want to divert program flow. So uh, maybe at instruction number three, for instance, something happens, um, and if, if, if that thing happens, you tell the program to say, I want you to move to a different part of the program. That's essentially what branching entails, right? You're trying to divert the flow of the program to a different section of the program, instead of executing it sequentially. Right, so if you have 1,000 lines of code, that, uh, if your branch condition at uh, line number five, for instance, and if that condition is satisfied, you will move, you divert program flow. You move to a different section of the program. And how do you move? You move by making use of those different branch instructions. Moving is dependent on whether a particular condition is satisfied. A condition, when a condition is satisfied, whatever processing you are doing has to evaluate to true. When a condition is not satisfied, whatever it is you are doing has evaluated to false. This is the reason why we use things like BEQ, BNE, BGT, BLT, SLT, right? All of these things are, are doing, what they're doing is the same thing. For BEQ, you are checking if two values are the same. If the value in 8 is the same as the value in 9, move to a different part of the program. How do you move to a different part of the program? You specify the label that represents that part of the program. Parts or portions of the program will typically have labels associated with them. Is that not so? Let me just pull something out here so that um, this is sad, right? Um, <clears throat> Look at this this particular example, for instance. I don't know if you guys can see, right? I don't know if is this good enough. Line number four has what we call this is a label. You know what a label is? It just represents a section of code, right? The, the section of well, instructions that are related to each other. If you look at line number 28, this is a different type of label. It's a section of this particular program. It represents, again, instructions that are logically related to each other. Again, line number 44, different part of the program. They are isolated. They are part of one program, that, but they're segmented because they do different things. You, you have these different levels because depending on whether a particular condition is satisfied, you want to move to that part of the program. But, but, but the part of the program where you move to has to be, has to be specified by the person writing that, that program, right? the program, which is you. So like, like in this particular example, for instance, we're saying, uh, look at line number 29. We are saying, Whenever this condition evaluates to true, BGT does and nine does and eight. When, when, when that condition evaluates to true, go to breakout label. Where is breakout label? Line number forty-four. Do you see this, uh, Josephine? They are not seeing. Uh, they are not seeing because you're obstructing. JD. They're not seeing because they're abstracting. Oh, right. Um, so, 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 so you notice that. Think about this. BGT. BGT. Dollar sign nine. Dollar sign eight. Simply means. Check and maybe you know this better. I guess. No. Check if BGT is just branch if greater than right. BGT branch if greater than. So we are saying. If the value in 9 is greater than the value in 8, divert program, the program to the part of this source code which is represented by breakout label. So when this condition evaluates to true, you will move, you will branch to line number 44. Is this making sense? Do you all understand what we, we understand, right? Sorry? What are you doing? 
we are, we are looking at, uh, we were trying to look at, somebody asked about fundamentals and we're starting with branches and then we're going to move to loops and then procedures. Uh, it turns out that you can't discuss, um, you, can't, you cannot discuss loops without discussing branches, right? It's like a chicken egg problem. You can't have a chicken without an egg and you can't have a, an egg without chicken or something. But, but, um, because it turns out that you use branches in, in loops. Do we all understand how branches work? You're, you're, just, you're, you're just working with input values to check if they will result to either true or false. If the result of a branch operation results to true, you will branch to a specified label. If the result of that branch operation is false, you will execute the next instruction. This is how branches work, with the exception of the unconditional branch, which will always take you to that branch irrespective of what happens. Let's use numbers, right? One instead of registers, two. Okay, uh, let's say this is a uh, add, add i and then we'll just say dollar sign 8 and dollar sign 0, 5. In here we'll just say add i dollar sign 8 dollar sign 0, 100. If we execute this program, and it would work by the way, this program is valid syntactically, what would be in 8? So we are following them. If we execute this program, what would be in 8? What would be in register 8? Okay. B EQ is branch if equal, meaning that if the two input values are the same, branch. Is is this input value one and two? Is one and two the same? No, so it's false. So you will not branch. What do you do? You execute the next line. But this B, E, Q, are these the same? B, E, Q is just branch if equal. Are these, first you check, are they equal? True, yes, so because they're equal branch, what do you do? You divert program flow here. When you come in here, the first thing you do is you say add 100 to register eight. So the value in register eight will actually be 100 here. Yes, 100. If, if you have two and two here, but if you have one and two, the value will be five. In, in all these different cases, you notice that what you do when you're, branch, when you're using branches, what you do is dependent on what result you're going to get when you execute the branch instruction. Uh, and so really, how you branch is dependent on what, what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do. Uh, okay, add i is equal to five. I'll bring this e here, right? Add, okay. Add i.
guys again this if you were to write this down it would execute just fine this works this is a well you need to represent registers here but question what is the value in register h here Is one and two equal? No. Okay, so we got to a label. Is one and one not equal? No. What is the answer here? Branch if not equal. What is the answer? Is it true or false? <laughs> okay, so if it's false, then yeah, yeah, it's a tricks, right? <laughs> Like if you think about it, branching is, uh, I assure you, if there's a question in the exam or if you're ever working, you're going to work with these things a lot next year. Oh, come on, me, you're working with this unless if you quit the course here, right? There's a lot of this coming, like uh, logical operators and whatnot, there are a lot of them coming. In fact, scratch that, we have, when we start dealing with logic gates, we look at like Boolean, Boolean algebra, right, which is like this, logical operators and not exclusive or and whatnot. What is the value in eight? What is the value in eight if we execute this? What is the value in register eight? What? No, if, you, if we execute this program, this, we, then we write this in QT and then we run this. What is the value in register eight? All you have to do is ask yourself, BEQ checks if the two input values are equal. You ask yourself, is one equal to two? No. So because it is not equal, you will execute the next instruction. You will not branch. Not branching means you execute the following instruction because program execution is top to bottom. When you're running Qt spin, you're running the program like so. But when you come across a, con a conditional operation, like when you, a branch operator, you check if the result is true or false. All you're doing with branching is you're checking if the result is going to be true or false. If it is true or if it is yes, you shall branch. If it is false or if it is no, you shall execute the next line. So in this case, because one and two are not equal, you shall ex execute the next line. You come here, branch if not equal. Is one not equal to two? Yes. So what do you do? you branch, and then A to have 100. Well, here's another way of looking at this. B, G, T, uh, Before you proceed, yeah? how do you show it in the Because you're just saying red, so. <laughs> what, what do you mean, how do you show it? Like, uh, that's when you go to the context where they're not equal to branch. Yeah. Now, Oh, I'm, I'm just showing you, I'm showing you what Qt spin does. Like you're going to go to, to that, because I, I mean, I, um, I'm, I'm showing you what, how the program, because the, you, you see, you won't see what Qt spin is doing unless if you step through the code, if you're executing it line by line, you won't. If you, if you just hit the play button, it will just show you the result. So. What I'm telling you is, like I'm, I'm telling you how you arrive at the result. If you were to run this in Qt spin, you will see the value 100 in register eight. So what I'm trying to tell you is the, the reason why you see 100 instead of five is because once you get here, what will be ex this will not be executed. What will be executed next is the things that are associated with go here label, which is this instruction. Which is why I'm telling you program flow, it's like, you can't show this, but I'm just showing you what, ha what is actually happening. Instead of executing these instructions, line, you're executing them line by line, but because this is true, you're diverting flow control. So in actual fact, once you get here, it will be like uh, Qt spin in here, execute up to here, and then you come here, um, you jump three, and then you will go to four. This will never be executed for this thing. Here is one way of looking at it. B, G, T, two, comma, one. 
a If we run this piece of code, <clears throat> uh, I'll just say we have, okay, we'll just say we exit here. Assume we exit here explicitly. Because remember what we said, every time you have labels, make sure that you explicitly exit, right? If we run this code, what, what is the value in register nine? Sorry? If we run this program, this will work. If we run this program, what is the value in register nine? Sorry? What is the value in register nine? Just say the value in register nine, what is the value? Really? Let's, okay. Let's start execution here of the program, right? Top to bottom, first thing we do is we check. Is one equal to two? No. So we execute the next one. Is, is one not equal to two? Yes. So what do we do? For at this point, we divert program control to go there. In go there, what do we do? All we do is we say, add 100 or load 100 into register eight and you exit. This will never happen. So the thing when you divert program flow control here, this will never be executed. You must think about what's happening and you see this thing. Flow control, this is the beauty of flow control and this is why you need, when you're writing a program, if you're given a problem and you're writing a program, if it's an exam or test, Think about what's happening to the different instructions. This will never be executed. Why? Well, because one in this case will always, this will always be true. The moment, because this is true, one is not equal to two now, is it? So it's true. The moment you come here, you always go to go here. Where is go here? Go here means you're jumping these things, you're skipping these things. Go here, here is here, right? You would only do that if if this was maybe um, like so. Question, what is the value in register nine now? It's negative two because we come here, well, okay, negative two, quite right. What is the value in register eight? If we were to run this, what would be in register eight? What's the value in register eight? Five. What is the value in register five? What is the value in register eight? I don't see register eight. Yes, register eight. So in nine you're saying it's negative two, right? What is what if eight? Because we're working with two registers here. Zero is the answer. Registers always have a value of zero, right? Good. And the reason you have zero is is why you come here. Is one equal to two? No. So you will not go to that label, you come here, next instruction. Is one not equal to one? No, so you come here. Is two greater than one, BGT, two greater than, yes. So you will divert program flow control to go there. Once you go to go there, you jump these things, these things will never be executed. Everything in here will never be executed. So you jump here, and then that's it. So eight will still be like zero, and then nine will be negative two. This is why most of the, the question that you are working towards, for instance, in the quiz, the reason why you, you are prompting a user to enter things is because you are dynamically getting these values. In, in an actual program, you don't hard code these values. It would be like input values that someone is entering. So based on the input value, you get the desired output, which is why we have those A's and A pluses, because the value will be evaluated to true or false depending on what input you give it. So if the input is one, if the input is two here, 
You branch. If it's not two, you will not branch. The, the key to understanding the key to understanding branches or branching is this flow control. Think about what is being evaluated. Just form a mental picture. If I if I'm using B and, and, and really it's like BLT, it could be BGT, it doesn't matter, it could be BEQ, it could be BNE, it doesn't matter. All of these things will ensure that the input values, right? Input value here and here. When you combine these two things here, when you evaluate these two things, the answer must be true or false. It can never be anything else. It's either true or false. If it is true, then you branch. If it is false, you execute the next instruction. This is how it works, really. Question. What is the value in eight? If we execute this now, we just remove BGT. What is the value in eight? Okay, what is the value in nine? Good, because when you start executing, is one equal to two? No, so execute the next line. Is one not equal to one? Of course not, it's, it's equal, so it's, this is false, right? You execute the next line in line number three. Line number three is an unconditional branch. It just tells you, just go there, branch to that label. At which point, program flow goes here. You skip everything. So eight will have zero, and then nine will have negative two. Right, so you better think about, um, about these things here. Uh, the more you practice, the better you become at this. And for, for really conditions, it's like, uh, for the most part, because for MIPS, you're just dealing with integer values, so it's like checking numbers, right? You better be smart about this. Um, here's a question for you. Last, last, oh, God. If we were to execute this, what would be the value in nine? We already know that uh, we come here. Is one, is one, is one equal to two? No. Is one not equal to one? Of course not, so you execute this. Is negative two less than negative 10? No. So you shall execute this. And then foolishly enough, what we've done, right? We haven't exited. We said if this was in main, we'd have to exit. But because we haven't exited, by the way, this has a log result in a logical error. This label will be executed because there's no exit. But we're supposed to exit here. So, in which case, um, um, uh, the value of nine is not negative two. Actually, it's zero. Yeah. Think about this for a second. You come at three. When you, ex when, you, you, when you are about to run the program, all the registers are set to zero. You come here, you check, is one equal to two? Of course not, so you execute the next line. Is one not equal to one? Of course not, they're equal, so this is false. You execute the next line. Is negative two less than negative 10? Of course not, this is greater. So what do you do? You execute the next line where you just slot in five into register number eight, and then you exit. Nine will still be zero, but eight will be five. It's all about these things, what hap what's happening to, what, what, what these operations result in. That's the key here. Now, which brings us to, is this fine now? Do you, under, do you have an idea of how, it wasn't so hard now, I guess. Um, sorry? Back when? <laughs> No, but I did this. Uh, I did this, I think. Um, <laughs> I did this with the, with the, do you remember that, and then someone came up, I think they did computer studies and they looked at, uh, 
those flowcharts that you have. The reason I included those flowcharts, you remember those flowcharts? With a diamond sign. Hmm? Do you remember these things? This is what it does. It, this, this was meant to say, this represents the condition. Yes. No. Fundamental, whenever you're dealing with condition, conditional operators, whether you're going to be using if statements, if this is very, in high level programming languages, this is what you're working with. This usually helps you understand. So I figured people would be able to understand if I, if I use this, but I don't know. Uh, but it's a good thing that at least you understand now. Loops, right? A loop fundamentally, you use the loop for you to execute a series of instructions over and over again. Uh, and really the, the discussion um, or argument for when you might want to execute a piece of code over and over again, I mean, that's irrelevant, right? There are plenty of use case scenarios. Most of these programs that you work with, they're always in a loop. Like for instance, uh, how, how is it that uh, a, a, an application that requires an internet connection, is always attempting to connect to the internet when you cut off the internet, for instance. You're in a loop, right? Continuously check if there's internet access. When you're logging in, same thing. So, fundamental with the loop, you want to execute a series of instructions over and over again. But for you to be able to execute a series of instructions over and over again, there are a couple of things that you need to do. You first of all need to identify the things that you want to execute over and over again, right? This would be your loop body. The actual processing. So maybe you want to print a, a, a range of numbers, right? In succession. Maybe you want to print student scores one at a time. Let's say it's 65 students. How do you write a program that's going to print each of the student scores? You start looping from, if the user details are ordered in alphabetical order, you start by the person who is like at the top list Read the student computer number, print the result. Second student, print the result. So you notice in all these 65 iterations, you are just printing the result. Instead of you having print statements, 65 of them, it's better you just have a series of code represented by a loop body. For you to implement a loop body, you use a label. So we'll call this uh, example loop. And we know that a loop is followed by full columns. Within this loop body is where you have the things that you're going to be, like the processing and everything else in the conditions. So a loop is composed of the things that you're going to do over and over again, that's key. What do you want to repeat? What do you want to repeat, right? What you want to repeat is dependent on the question. The other key thing the loop must have is the condition that will allow you to get out of that loop, because you better get out of that loop at some stage. If you don't get out of that loop, you will always be doing that thing over and over again. You never stop. It's like, for those of you doing philosophy, you are excessive fast, right? You're just pushing that thing there. But you, so you want a way to break out of that loop. So question you have to ask yourself is, how are you going to get out of that loop? How you're going to get out of that loop is when a particular condition evaluates to true. Those conditions we're talking about, so you better think of a condition similar to the things we looked at. BEQ, BNE, uh, BGT, BOT, SLT, whatever you, you want to use, right? All those different things. One of them must allow you, to, must evaluate to true so that when it evaluates to true, you will branch to a label that is outside of the loop, the things you're repeating. So, you must have condition as a first statement in your in your loop, there must be a condition. And then, after the condition, the things you're processing. Another key thing, right? So, after you specify the condition that will allow you to break out of that loop, and you specify the things that you're going to be repeating, maybe printing numbers, right? Printing numbers, like if you have a lot of numbers, printing each of those numbers is the repetition process, so it's the processing. The condition would be associated to 
the, the number after the last one you want to print. So break out when you reach the number after the last one you want to print. The other key thing you better ask yourself is, how are you going to repeat? Right, so once you process the first time, how are you going to restart the same thing? It's like today you ate, you slept, how are you going to do the same thing tomorrow, right? Unconditional branching. B, because unconditional branching, you, you will always branch whether you like it or not when you use unconditional branching, which is why we are saying when you're using, when you're working with loops, just use unconditional branch, B, followed by the name of the loop body. So in this case, it's example, loop. If you think about it, even before we put things here, once you get to line number three and 